So we may as well kick this off. This is a talk about deploying and scaling microservices. Uh, my name is Sam Newman. I work at a company called ThoughtWorks. If you want to know about what we do, uh, we have a booth outside uh, where we'll also be giving away copies of my book. Uh, please buy my book. Uh, please buy my book. It's great. Um, anyway, I'm going to talk to you really about a bunch of stuff today, but we're going to start off, uh, as, as Laura did in her security talk this morning, trying to set down some framing principles. This talk is a talk about deploying and scaling microservices, and a lot of the technology we rely upon to do that is changing rapidly. And that means that the information I give you today about specific technical implementation details will be different in a few weeks. So I want to give you some sort of core principles, some ideas to take, take with you, some concepts around artifacts, which I think are often underlooked, because I think that framing will help you evaluate the new technology that comes out. And then we'll, at the last section, we're going to be baking off effectively three different platforms that can be used for scaling microservices in the form of Mesos, uh, uh, Kubernetes, and Docker Swarm. Uh, we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to start by talking about these core principles, and we should start off with my definition of microservices. I talk about these things. I tend to talk about uh, things like business, um, you know, business-oriented services. Um, I think when uh, Fred talked earlier, he talked sort of about business capability-oriented services. It's sort of my mindset as well. Uh, the thing I really focus on, though, when talking about what makes microservices different to other forms of service-oriented architecture, and I do think microservices are just a form of, of service-oriented architecture, what I tend to focus on a lot is this, independent deployability. Most people who pick a microservice architecture do so because they want to go faster. Um, they'll talk about autonomy, and sometimes that's nice to give people autonomy, but the end goal is to shorten that cycle from concept to cash. How do I get something out into a production environment more quickly? Now, if you don't focus on your, making sure your services are independently deployable, what you end up with is a distributed system that has to be deployed in one big lump, and that is a significantly worse place to be than with a monolithic system. So you need to be in the situation where it's the norm that you make a change to one service and deploy it by itself into production environment without having to change anything else. This is going to be the core of what allows you to go fast. There are exceptions to every rule, but they should be exceptions. The rule is that you should be able to make a change to a service and deploy it into a production environment without having to change other services. That's how you're going to go fast. That's how you're going to go fast safely. And a lot of what I'll talk about today are sort of other principles that reinforce this idea. Because if there's only one thing you remember from the talk today, it's buy my book. If there are two things, it's buy my book and remember about independent deployability. Now we're going to think about the second problem we've got, which is this, which is how do I get software from my laptop into a production environment? How we do this changes how we think about deployment and especially deployment of microservices. Some of you are probably familiar with structures like this. Uh, this is a deployment pipeline or a build pipeline. It's a model of the stages that our software moves through as it goes from, say, being checked in to going into production. You might have a CI tool or a CD tool that allows you to represent this flow in an actual tool. Or if you don't, this is probably a process that some of you have in your heads. Uh, and we have this idea with these systems that, OK, we check some source code in. That source code then is typically built by a CI tool. And so it might be a compilation step or a, a packaging step. Uh, and then we have effectively a deployed artifact. And it's that deployed artifact that's going to be put into our different environments. So when we think about a build pipeline or a continuous delivery pipeline like this, what we do is we think about taking that artifact that we build at the beginning of this process, and we move it through these stages, and we are validating it as it goes. So if my tests pass, it's good enough to go to UAT. If it passes the UAT process, which could be a manual process, it's good enough to go into our performance and so on and so forth until hopefully we end up in a production environment. I'm hoping that so far this isn't rocket science. This is probably quite familiar to you. There are some things, though, that people often get wrong. Um, one of the first things is you really need to focus on the idea that you have one artifact for all environments. So when you put that artifact into UAT or performance or prod, if you rebuild that artifact over and over again, 
what you're doing is, well, just blatantly wasting CPU cycles. Because if it's the same source code and the same build process, why do the same thing over and over again? The, re the other reason why it's important to only build that artifact once is if the artifact you build and test is not the same as the, the artifact you then build and deploy, there are some things that can slip into the deployment, to the build process that can change the behavior of the application. I know there's some C and C++ programmers in the room. You'll all know about the power of different flags to change the behavior of programs in production, even if you're not using macros. You can even do this with Scala. Scala's brought us many, many things, warm laps during compilation cycles, um, long treatises on type theory. It also has brought us compilation flags that change behavior of things like string interpolation. So build your artifact once and once only. It therefore follows that the configuration for an artifact, a thing you deploy, has to be separate from the thing you've built. So when I deploy an artifact in a dev, at a UAT, a performance environment, I have my artifact, I have the configuration for that artifact, and those need to be separate things. And that's actually quite useful because then you can have control around who has access to certain configuration sets. Um, so that plays nicely in sort of very corporate IT environments and also just in very sensible, maybe everybody shouldn't have the production passwords on their laptop type environments. You should also use the same deployment process everywhere. Because if the deployment process you use to deploy into production is different to UAT, is different to dev, you will find defects later on and that's pain. What you want is by the time you deploy into production to have used that same deployment process like 100 times on your release candidates that you're moving through your pipeline. And so when we're thinking about our different deployment platforms, I like picking deployment platforms that allow me to have sort of a unified artifact, a universal artifact, and allow me to have a unified deployment process. This is often what I will use. I, I like writing this up as a script. I will use things like Fabric uh, or something else and this is, this is the core of any sensible service deployment process, I think. It is a command line interfaces because command line interfaces are very easy to automate, they're very easy to type in, they're very easy to copy and paste. I don't like GUIs. I like GUIs for telling me about stuff, I don't like GUIs for controlling stuff. Um, the first word is deploy. I think intent is good in a CLI. Um, and then we have this, the service names. This is the service that we want to deploy. We then specify a version number, or it could be a build label. This is the version of the software we want to put into a given environment. And normally what I'll do is I'll script up other things. So this will pull in it from a, an artifact repository, or I might give you the word local. Local means it's going to look on your local machine for something you just built. This makes it very easy for you to use exactly the same deployment process for just deploying on your local laptop as part of dev. Or I might say latest, and latest will go and find the latest green build and deploy that. And finally, you have this concept of an environment, a location into which I'm going to place my service. This is a CLI that can be used by developers, by QA, by production people. I've been using variants of this for about 10 years. Before I even, you know, was even involved in microservices, I still think this works. And again, when we come and look at some of this stuff that's interesting here, we'll see different deployment platforms make this easier or harder. This concept of environment, though, is sort of worth diving into. What do we mean when we talk about environment? Now, environment often means something about restriction, who can and can't see your service. But for, for this talk, the things I really want to focus on is really what we talk about when we talk about the topology. If we think about what an environment might be for my service in, for example, UAT, it might be a couple of services, load balance, talking to a database. And so I deploy my service maybe onto two machines, and it's sort of it's production-ish, but it's not exactly the same as production, because having copies of production environment is often quite expensive, and so we tend to defer that until further on in our pipeline. When we start hitting our performance or our production environments, though, we will have a different topology. Now we have to have a topology capable of handling the full load, and also handling that with an acceptable tolerances around things like failure mode. So here, for example, I might have four nodes, perhaps load balance across an availability zone or some different data centers, talking to, say, a standard sort of uh, primary replica database setup. So the topology of the environment is changing. Same artifact. The same artifact all the way through, but the configuration of that service in a given environment is changing. The topology is somewhere else. And so when we're thinking about our deployment platforms, it also follows that we need platforms that allow us to represent that topology in some nice, easy way 
And I hope I'm not saying anything out of order when I say, and of course, however you define that topology, should be something which is version controlled. Because if you're not version controlling stuff rigorously right now, please don't do microservices. Uh, go sort that out first. Um, so, summarize those core principles. So, independent deployability is king. That is the most important thing. If you can independently deploy your services in production, you have probably got a lot of things right. One artifact for all environments. So, avoid really doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, and try and use the same deployment process everywhere. Now let's dive into the part of the talk that is often the thing that people think is going to be boring. But I think thinking about artifacts is really interesting. I spent many years in build systems. This is, this is the, my biggest source of pain, was how we tended to package up our applications. So let's talk about artifacts. What do we want out of artifacts? What do we want out of artifacts for our services? Um, we want it to be something that's easy to create. It's a good start, easy to create. I want it to be easy to deploy. With microservices, what we're often trying to do is, as James Lewis, James Lewis sort of says, you, we're trying to buy options with microservices. We like to keep our options open. And one of the things, therefore, I like with my artifacts is that they abstract out the underlying technology stack. I shouldn't care, from the point of view of someone deploying the application, I shouldn't care whether or not it's a Go app, a Java app, a Scala app, or a Julia app. Just, just, I just, just deploy it and it runs. Uh, it should also be something that is good for a developer-focused person and good for an operations-focused person. I am a proponent of DevOps. I hope I don't have to tell people in this room that DevOps does not mean no ops. If, you're not, if you want to talk about that, we can talk about that offline. Let's start with the, um, probably the most common artifact I see, and that is tarballs, uh, giant bundles of stuff. Uh, how many people have seen the after effects of, say, oil spills, as the oil washes up on the beach. You see, like, wildlife dying, trapped in this sort of giant ball of stuff. Well, that's what developers do to code all the time, right? We just bundle it all together, and we sort of just go, ah, oh, well, it's kind of, you know, it was easy to do, because I just dropped all the oil in the water, but it's kind of difficult to do anything with now. Here, you deal with it. And we throw these things over to operations people like me who then catch it and go, I hate you with a passion. Because now, deploying these things becomes difficult. The issue is these things are trivially easy to create. You know, tar CVFC, a directory, and I'm done. That's easy. I can do that. Now I've got to unpack it. I've got to change permissions on files. I've got to create users to run the processes. I've got to install any dependencies that this software has on that operating system. I've got to move everything to the right locations. This, this is the reason why people end up with like large puppet and chef scripts, because the developers are giving them tarballs. And you have these huge, complicated manifests, and people go, oh, puppet and chef are rubbish. And it's like, no, you're rubbish. So no, they are not easy to deploy. Sometimes they can abstract out a tech stack, it depends, um, but it's not great for that. Uh, they might be good for developers, they are definitely not good for operations people. Most operations people I know think these are a terrible idea, and that this is part of why developers shouldn't be allowed nice things. Uh, let's talk about stack-specific artifacts. Uh, here we're talking about things like gems, we're talking about uh, NuGet packages, pips, those sorts of things. These are the these are the sort of the artifacts specific to your technology stack. Some of these are suitable for deployment of services. Some of them need a bit more work. They need a bit more help. Uh, certainly out of the box, something like by itself, um, a jar is not going to be any use as a service deployment. Uh, Chocolatey NuGet might. I mean, that could, so that could install services, for example, in Windows. Uh, they are normally fairly easy things to create because Developers in that tech stack know that tech stack, they know the tooling around that stuff. You're probably already using these artifacts to create shared libraries amongst your development teams. They're not easy to deploy, uh, necessarily. Um, the biggest issue is that they don't do a very good job of abstracting out the technology stack. You've now got to deal with the packaging system for whatever artifact you're using. This becomes especially problematic when you have technology stacks that use tool chains that require large amounts of those tool chains to be in the production systems. There have been ongoing issues for years knowing how to get Ruby deployment right in production environments, having issues with leaving things like RVM lying around, which can themselves be security problems. Uh, again, 
Good for devs, good for ops. I don't think operations people really like this stuff. Again, I, this thinks it's a bit lazy. I think it's fine for shared libraries, but in the whole, I tend to avoid um, sort of um, tech stack specific artifacts. Uh, the one exception I t I've been making a little bit recently is around Go, just because it's Go, right? And therefore, it's great. Uh, because go, right? Go, 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 docker, docker, go, go, docker, docker, go, docker, 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 microservices, go, docker. Uh, in all seriousness, right, uh, Go does create these very tiny little statically linked binaries. They're very nice and easy to deploy. Um, I have a little bit of a soft spot for them, but they still have some of the same issues as other types of service deployments. You've got to put the artifact in the right place. You have to set up your users for it. Uh, but nonetheless, it's sort of, you know, kind of an interesting aside. Let's move on to something a little bit more interesting. Let's talk about operating system specific uh, deployments, artifacts. Think about what deploying an, uh, a, a, um, package, a, a package looks like on, say, Ubuntu. Here we are. I've got my command. I've got app get, I install, and I've got the name of an artifact. So this could be if I've set up my own in house artifact repository server, this could just be in the um, repositories list. Uh, things like Artifactory and Nexus can often masquerade as OS-specific artifact repos. It's quite simple, right? Looks a little bit like this, doesn't it? The mapping between these two things isn't that far off, makes it quite easy to create that wrapping script. Um, these things are really, really good because we have a whole tool chain on our operating system, even on Windows, for managing packages. We can check that the thing we think we installed is actually the thing we've installed. We can look and query versions. We can define <coughs> dependencies so that when we install a package, we automatically install the dependencies as well. And these things become very, very easy to install. Organizations that use this as a unit of deployment when they create these packages well tend to have very little to no Puppet or Chef requirements because most of what they're doing are just package installations. This is, this is a great way of actually reducing the amount of stuff you've got on your manifests. The issue and the reason we don't use this is partly A, because developers are in charge and developers are not operations people, but really these things are not easy to create. Um, there is a, a package manager called FPM. FPM is sort of an abstraction layer over different Linux platforms. The idea is you can use one tool chain to create it for different packages on package manager under the hood. Uh, it's not too hard to work with, but even the developers understood how painful creation of these artifacts was because they call it FPM, which stands for Effing Package Manager. Um, I think you could probably guess what Effing means. Uh, they are, though, really easy to deploy. You just you run that command. Hosting these things is, is pretty easy nowadays. They do an excellent job of abstracting out the technology stack. Do you care what MySQL is in? Do you care what um, Nginx is written in? You just install the package and it's running. It's either running or it's not. It's the service is there or it isn't. You do not care what the tech stack is. Good for devs, good for ops. Operations people love this stuff. Uh, developers tend not to because they don't really understand the operating system that they run it, deploy into in production. Uh, even, in this de even in this decade of easily ac um, accessible virtualization, uh, in the, in, you know, we have got Vagrant, we've got Docker that we can run on our laptops. Developers still insist on developing on a different operating system than they deploy onto, which is just crazy and I think in this, in this sort of year, inexcusable. Uh, get over yourself, developers. Develop your software in the same operating system you're going to deploy on. Docker makes that very easy. Vagrant makes that very easy to do in a very safe way. This doesn't solve all of our problems, though, because we have other issues that can crop up. So I've got my build process, and I've created a couple of artifacts. And I'm starting a journey on this microservices whole thing. So what I'm thinking is, OK, so I'm going to take one of my old machines that I used to have my monolith on, and I'm going to take these two built artifacts, and I'm going to put them both onto the same machine. Uh, and it will be good, right? I can use my nice command lines. It's going to be wonderful. And all my dependencies get installed. But then we start hitting the sorts of issues that come up when we start deploying multiple services onto the same host, onto the same sort of execution environment. We have little things like, you know, the diamond dependency problem. Uh, issues like, OK, one service needs one version of, a, of some other dependent thing and a different service needs a different version of a thing. And we want this to be the case. We want to be able to change these services independently. We want to be able to deploy them independently. But we can have situations where the dependencies that we have on that machine clash. This happens all the time. 
So now we've got a situation where we're not always sure that when we update dependencies of a service that we go to deploy, whether or not they'll clash. This actually happens even simply with things like Puppet and Chef. Puppet and Chef want to be controlling the whole box. That sort of pushes you to having one set of Puppet scripts or Chef scripts for the whole machine, not per service, for the whole machine. Because when you start trying to run these different runs, you know, they, they can't run at the same time. So you can't do independent deployment very easily. We have other issues that occur when we coexist multiple services on one machine. We have simple things like they let me write code, and I checked into my normal, uh, normally highly performant code that chews up all the CPU very effectively. And I wipe out everything else on that machine because, there are now, because of resource salvation. In this situation, we've allowed the side effects of a new version of software to impact other services. This doesn't give us confidence in doing independent deployment. We're in situations like this, when we have side effects that occur as a result of deploying, we start putting more processes around our deployment. We start thinking, actually, we should test all these things together and deploy them together. When we have issues like this, it's not helping us achieve independent deployability. That's why most organizations that use microservices at scale end up moving to this kind of setup. They find a way of creating isolated execution environments and having one service per little sort of environment. This could be a virtual machine or, as we'll talk about in a minute, a container. Normally, what people do here is sort of traditionally, this would be where virtualization comes in. This is where you do something like a type 2 hypervisor. This is what Zen, KVM, VMware, uh, Amazon, when you launch an image on Amazon, that is a type 2 hypervisor. So you have a physical machine, you've got a thing called the hypervisor that vises hyperly, uh, that manages isolation of things. We come up with great names in tech, don't we, that have so meaningless. Um, and these things work quite nicely. Uh, one of the really nice things you can do with these is, is you can actually create custom images as well. So your deployment process can be, OK, I'm going to spin up a virtual machine, then I'm going to install the dependencies of my software, then I'm going to deploy my service, and that's my deployment. The other thing you can do is say, no, actually, what I'm going to do is create an artifact, which is <clears throat> a whole virtual machine image. So out of my build process, I might get, for example, as Netflix do, get a custom Amazon machine image. These custom images can then be launched on the hypervisor. Um, so rather than having this deployment time cost of installing all the dependencies every time you do a deployment, it's a one-time build cost. Uh, <clears throat> it also allows you to spin services up very, very quickly. And you can also um, get nice side effects because it makes it very easy to use immutable infrastructure. So rather than ever touching that machine, you blow the machine away and spin up a new VM. The issue again, though, with operating system packages is they're not always very easy to create these, uh, these um, custom images. Amazon AMIs are pretty straightforward. Uh, there's even a tool from Netflix called the Aminator that makes it a bit easier. But the tool chains with things like VMware are a bit painful. And if you're targeting more than one virtualization platform, it quickly becomes a bit unmanageable. There is a tool from HashiCorp called Packer, which can really help. It gives you an abstraction on top of that. And if you're already using Puppet, Chef, Ansible, or Salt as part of a configuration pipeline, then you can actually use that to help you create the virtual machine image using Packer. Deployment can be easy, can be hard. Again, on Amazon, spinning up a custom AMI is trivially easy. Um, spinning up a 20 gigabyte VMware image that you built and then you're moving across your network to the chagrin of your knock, who are banging down your doors wondering what the hell's happening to their supposedly resilient 10 gigabit backplane. Um, anyway, these, those, you don't always make yourself popular with this sort of stuff. They do, though, do an excellent job, a really excellent job of abstracting out the underlying technology stack which is really useful for us in the service land. Again, I don't even actually care now what operating system I'm, I'm working with to some extent. I launched the VM, my service is there. Everyone's happy. Good for devs, good for ops. The build times for these things can take time. Often what you're doing is you're taking what was a deployment cost and making it a build cost. Building custom AMIs for Amazon can take 15, 20 minutes easily, depending on what you're doing with them. And if the only way you've got of actually spinning a service up is to wait for your build process to create an AMI, that's really going to hurt developer productivity. So if you are going to adopt things like custom images as artifacts, make sure your developers have some other way of launching their software. Um, so just from a fast feedback point of view. Now, one of the downsides to these sort of custom images is not the concept, it's the cost. There's a long time taken to build these things often. 
Um, the spin-up time can still take a few minutes, and on some virtualization platforms can take 10 or 15 minutes. That's certainly what you see with some of the platforms like Rackspace. The other issue is the, the cost in terms of the, the amount of computing resources that go into um, managing the isolation of these virtual machines. There is a hypervisor that's maintaining separation between these virtual machines. Each of those virtual machines is running a full operating system stack, which might be overkill when you want to all to be on the same OS. That's sort of why people got interested in the microservices space around containers, specifically because containers give you a way of creating isolated execution environments more cheaply. At its core, the idea is that rather than having a hypervisor that handles separation, you use your operating system kernel. The operating system kernel is already responsible for keeping things isolated. And what we do is we just ask the kernel to do more things. And so when you spin up containers, they're different forks on the process tree. And so it's one kernel for the whole machine, so you're not reproducing the kernel overhead. You also don't need a hypervisor anymore. One of the other interesting quirks with hypervisors is the more VMs you pack on the machine, the more work the hypervisor does. So often with microservices, we're creating smaller things that need few resources. That means it can become very cost ineffective to have lots of small VMs. Uh, and so again, it, you end up spending more and more money on fueling the hypervisor rather than running your services. We don't have that overhead with containers. The isolation isn't as good as hypervisors, but it's much more efficient Building these things it tends to be fast, and spinning them up is lightning fast. The issue historically has been there's no real standard around the tool chains for um, containers. You had lib contain, uh, libvirt, which was sort of getting there. Um, LXC was around and st is still around today, um, and that's what I started using first on Linux machines. These ideas have been around since Solaris Zones, OpenVZ, and stuff like that. The issue is we never really had the concept of things like artifacts for containers. So everyone would build art their, 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 their containers in different ways. That means spinning up a container was always effectively a, a sort of a scripted deployment process rather than run this thing. And that's actually why Docker has become popular, because all Docker did initially was say, OK, this container stuff looks quite useful, but the tool chain around it sucks. Even simple things like running five or six LXC containers on my, on my uh, machine is very easy to do, but I have to set up all the networking for it. That means you're doing IP tables. Where, um, friends do not let friends do IP tables. Um, so Docker came along and gave us uh, an image. It gave us artifact repositories. It gave us a nice tool chain uh, around creating effectively custom VMs, but in a much smaller, much more lightweight way. And so we can much more rapidly provision stuff. The cost of these isolated hosts, these isolated execution environments, is much more reduced. You can now much more densely pack these things up, much more cost effectively do so. And the effort of building them, the amount of computing resources, is reduced. So these things are pretty easy to create. Some of you have probably played around. Actually, how many people have built a Docker, their own sort of Docker image? Probably about 25%, right? I actually think the process is quite nice. It's just a line, it's just like, it's like a script. It's very familiar if you've ever done scripted uh, configuration of machines. You're not trying to deal with the complexity that some of the declarative provisioning systems deal with, like Puppet or Chef, because these things are normally one shot. If you want to change your software version, you build a new container. You throw the old one away, you deploy the new one. That's sort of the Docker mindset, which actually simplifies that deployment process. There's a couple of gotchas, but by and large, I think it's fairly straightforward. They are ridiculously easy to deploy. They are very good at abstracting out the technology stack. You don't care, it just runs. And if it's not running, the, doc, the container exits, right? Good for dev, good for ops. Developers love this stuff. Right? Developers love just getting random stuff off the street and sho shoving it in production machines and going, oh, that'll be fine. Operations people, they're people that sort of think maybe the site working is a good idea. Uh, maybe uptime is something people should care about. Uh, now, Docker is production ready. Uh, I knew people running Docker in production for at least a year before Docker themselves said it was production ready. Uh, but one of the gaps it's always had really is around the multi-machine management. So Docker works really well on a machine. You talk to a Docker engine, it manages isolation on your machine. That's great. If you want to run this in production yourselves, though, you have to have something on top. So you could either script this yourself or use one of the platforms. And we're going to look at some of those platforms now. So again, we're going to do a bit of a bake-off. What are the things we're looking for from our deployment platform? We talked about this before. We need some way of separating our artifact from our topology. So any platform that gives us this is, is you know, it's doing well. 
We want handling lots of services. That want that to be easy. That's great. And when I mean this, I mean this. I don't mean just oh, I can deploy a lot of them. I mean things like managing desired state and ensuring that desired state is continued. What's often called autonomic um, platforms. And something ideally that supports Docker images. We like them. They work really well. So a platform that supports Docker images is going to be doing quite well for us. Uh, so we can look at Docker Swarm, Mesos, and Kubernetes. Uh, let's start with Docker Swarm. Docker Swarm is probably the newest and I'd say least mature of these offerings in a way. Uh, the architecture of all these platforms is pretty, fam is pretty similar. Um, so here we have something called a, a Swarm Manager. It talks to things called Swarm nodes. And what you do is you run a command line interface and you talk to the Swarm Manager. The really nice thing is that the API, the command line interface for talking to the Swarm Manager, is, is very, very familiar. It's almost the same as what you would use talking to a single Docker engine. Commands like Docker PS, Docker Logs, running that against the Swarm Manager working exactly the same way as working against the Docker engine. And therefore, if you're used to using single node Docker, working with the Swarm becomes much easier. It's about 70% of the commands work um, from Docker engine onto the Swarm Manager. It's one of the nicest things it does. And when you say you go to, you go to the, Docker, the Swarm Manager and say, I want you to deploy the, this many things, and then you give it some additional information. You might tell it about how to distribute that load, and it handles that for you. In common with other types of platforms or scheduling systems, as this, as that's what this is, is it would support things like scheduling strategies. For example, we might have something like bin pack. So with bin pack, what the uh, Swarm Manager is going to do is try and densely pack every single node before it moves on to the next one. So it's really going to try and eke out every last bit of resource. This is very good when you're looking for low, uh, for really high low utilization. If you're in an environment where you'd like to turn off some of your managers, save some money, bin packing could make a lot of sense for you. You can also do spread. So where bin packing really densely packs things together, it may not do what you want in terms of spreading load across multiple machines, which is what you might want to, for doing things like improve resiliency. So spread will distribute your load evenly. All, these different all those images you spin up will get spin spun up across your machines as an even way as possible. Um, there's also more complex things like affinity saying this thing can, should be deployed next to this or shouldn't be deployed. There's even a random scheduling strategy for uh, Docker Swarm, which I think exists because people thought they could do it. I can't think of a good reason why you'd want to randomly distribute your crap all over your production infrastructure, but I don't know, maybe it's a Friday and you're all bored. Um, I mentioned that Docker Swarm supports the Docker command line. It also supports other parts of the tool chain. One of the things it supports is Docker Compose. So Docker Compose is originally an open source project called Ivy, but it's a way of defining effectively a configuration for a stack of containers and how they're related to each other. So in this example, we're spinning up two uh, Docker containers. Uh, one, which is going to be our web node, how we have some port mapping going on, and it has a link to another node, which is Redis. So this is going to spin up two things. This is a quite a nice way of effectively defining your service topology. You could use this to define an entire environment, but that wouldn't make much sense to me because we want independent deployability. So I would use one Docker Compose file per service and vary that per environment. But you can run this on Docker Swarm and it puts all the things in the right place. This is sort of like you know, cloud formation, if you've used that on Amazon, it's, it's, you'd use it in a similar way. And it's a very nice way of standing up stuff quite quickly. So there have been some issues, though, with Docker Swarm. It is fairly immature. Uh, historically, it had two big issues. It didn't rebalance, and it didn't restart failed containers. What I mean by that is if you lost a whole machine, and that machine was running loads of containers, Docker Swarm wouldn't reapply the original request you made. You say, I want 25 of these things. The machine died. It took five of them with it. And Docker Swarm will just carry on happily. That has now changed. It is now starting to take on more characteristics of being properly desired state. Systems that manage desired state have to keep checking. You asked me for 25 of these in a spread scheduling strategy, and that's still what you've got. That stuff has only just come in in the last couple of releases. Now, for me, this is quite core to a system. If I'm doing, using a scheduling system, I want it to be desired state. I want it to maintain a known state for me. I don't want to have to keep checking in. Getting this right is difficult. Uh, and so the fact that this only just coming in Docker Swarm gives me a couple of causes for concern. Uh, it does play very nicely with the rest of the Docker tool chain. If you're a developer, an operations person who's come from a single node setup, it's going to be very familiar. It's going to have a lot of low ceremony. That's really nice. And I think that's excellent. 
uh, probably the big problem for me is a lack of case studies. Um, so when I was doing the research this talk at the beginning of the year, I really hunted around for a long time trying to find case studies, and I found two. I found one case study from O'Reilly, who were building a platform as a service on top of Docker Swarm, and O'Reilly were my publishers. That's great, so I could reach out and have a chat to them. Um, there's also a rack space we're using Docker Swarm to create a PaaS. What I actually found out was that O'Reilly were actually building their solution on top of the Rackspace PaaS. And so what actually was two case studies was actually one case study, really, when you got down to it. Um, this, if you're using this for your production deployment infrastructure, I want more than one case study out there, right? I'm a risk-adverse individual. Let's talk about Mesos. Mesos has been around a long time. You're going to learn more about it from Stephen Rick's talk uh, later on, which you should definitely go to and get a bit more detail about how this works. So I'll, I won't spend too long on this. Familiar structure so far. We have a master. The master talks to uh, what used to be called Mesos slaves, but thankfully have been changed to Mesos agents. And at this point, we have to deal with the F word. And in the context of Mesos, that F word is frameworks. And frameworks really confused me because when I first came to Mesos, my understanding of a framework is it's something I use to help me use something else. So Hibernate is a framework for not understanding databases, right? You know, that sort of thing. Uh, Spring MVC is a framework for implementing web apps, whatever that might be. Frameworks in Mesos sense are not the same. Right? And this is annoying to me, because we do this all the time in computing. We say we have a name, a, def a term, a definition, a commonly understood definition, and then we reuse it somewhere else with a completely different name. Uh, how many people here have used Puppet before? A few, right? In Puppet, there is a thing called a class. Do you know how many, how many instances of a class you're allowed? One. Right? That's not a class, that's a singleton. But we didn't use that word, did we, because puppet. Um, so a framework in Mesos is more like what I'd say is a plugin. And it's actually two plugins, it's sort of a pair. You have a scheduler, and that's the thing you're going to talk to when you want a certain type of work scheduled across the nodes. And you have an executor. And the executor is a thing that lives on the host itself and manages the environment in which that job will run. So uh, I might, for example, use a Hadoop scheduler. And Mesos has been traditionally used a lot in data processing. So people running Hadoop, Spark jobs, Storm jobs, that sort of stuff. Mesos is excellent at that because of this plug-in model. So I would talk to the Hadoop scheduler to schedule my jobs. I would then run executors on my Mesos nodes, and they would manage those sort of jobs running there. And I can mix and match different plugins, different frameworks. And when we talk about microservices, or, and we talk about Docker, um, Sorry, we talk about Docker deployments on Mesos. We're actually talking about using a, a, a plugin called Marathon. So Marathon is there for long-running jobs. Marathon is what is doing things like the desired state management. It has all the same support around things like uh, scheduling strategies and affinities that you'd see in Docker Swarm, in fact, more. Um, this plugin idea is quite annoying to get your head around. But one of the things it's useful for straight away is it allows you to run mixed workloads. So if you're looking for a a sort of production scheduler that's also going to be able to handle your data processing. You've got SAMHSA jobs, you've got Spark, all that sort of stuff. You could run your, on the same clusters, you could mix all that load in together using this plugin model. And that's a really nice idea because then you, you don't have to invest in different types of uh, deployment platforms for different jobs. So that's kind of nice. You could also create your own plugins, uh, so your own frameworks. So this is one called Aromatic. Now, Aromatic is a very simple framework. What it does is you basically launch one-shot containers on Docker, and then they die, on, on Mesos, and they die. That doesn't seem terribly useful. So you literally you know, issue a curl command, spins it up, and it shuts it down. Why would you, why would you want to do that? Uh, how many people here have heard of Amazon Lambda? Right? A few. So Amazon Lambda is excellent. It's probably one of the best things uh, around a platform as a service that um, Amazon have done. So if you don't know what uh, uh, Amazon Lambda is, it's uh, on request or based on an event, it will spin up a very short-lived task, execute that task, and then die. Uh, so you can implement these things in Java, although it's a bit pointless because it takes long to spin up, or JavaScript. Uh, you could hook up to the API gateway. And this stuff is amazing because it's great from a security point of view, as Laura's mentioned earlier. If a thing isn't running, you can't crack it. It's great from a pricing point of view because you know, you're, you're, you're not running things. You don't need to run. Aromatic is sort of half of Lambda already on your Mesos. You've almost got your in-house serverless architecture with just a few lines of code. So Mesos, uh, really good if you want to know other workloads. Excellent for that. Very powerful, very widely used. 
and there are lots of case studies out there, and you're going to see one later today. Um, but seriously, you can throw a rock and get good case studies. Siri runs on Mesos. It's one of the first big sort of internal tech details we've been getting out of Apple was them talking about how they built their own framework for handling Siri, which I think runs on about like 30,000 nodes or something crazy like that. Uh, but there are more moving parts here. This was not a piece of technology that was designed specifically for handling deployment of these kinds of applications. It's a bit more general purpose. And the ecosystem around Mesos gets quite confusing, especially when you start throwing in things like um, uh, DSOS, which is the data center operating system coming from Mesosphere. Uh, but nonetheless, I think actually if the conservative choice is actually not bad one at all. Let's talk about Kubernetes now, our last platform. In some ways, this is the oldest. In some ways, it's the newest. So Kubernetes is, an, um, is not Google open sourcing their internal container technology and scheduling platform, because they're not stupid, and that's a competitive advantage to them. What they've done is they've looked at the abstractions they use internally, and have done a clean room re-implementation of that in the Kubernetes project. So you'll see these things called pods, and that's what they use internally. They have an open source Borg which is their internal system. They've sort of given you a, a detuned version. And something that they wouldn't actually make sense to because so much of that internal system is tied to internal technology as well. So you have to think about this. The abstractions are Google abstractions that work well for them and are tried and tested for Google. You are not Google. You might be Google. If you're Google, why are you in the room? You've got this at home. Go home. Uh, but it's also very new. So this is a brand new project, really. It's been around for not a very long period of time. Model is similar, right? We have an API server. I talk to things called kubelets. They're kind of cute little kubelets. I have a command line. I talk to the API server to do stuff. And then I sort of fudge some details here. Because uh, then we start getting to talk about what it is we actually deploy, or the unit of scheduling. Uh, with Marathon on Mesos, what we schedule is a Docker container. Docker Swarm, we're scheduling a Docker container. Uh, with Kubernetes, we're actually deploying pods. Just like a pea in a pod, a pod has got lots of little things inside it, and you deploy the whole pod, right? So a pod is a tightly, bang, it's like a tightly coupled collection of containers, uh, or metadata, or data volumes. Um, now, I wouldn't use pods with lots of things in them. I want independent deployability. Therefore. I am nearly always going to only have one thing inside my pod, unless I'm also putting, say, configuration files in there as well. Uh, some of you may have seen Fred's talk earlier. He sort of talked about some cases where you might want to have more tightly coupled two or three things that are always deployed as a unit together. That might be a situation where I'd use a pod, but I do those things very, very rarely. So I don't actually think for microservice architectures that the pod concept makes much sense to me. Uh, it feels actually like a lot of people are using it as performance optimizations. In some ways, this simplifies affinity. So with these scheduling platforms, you can often say, I want this thing deployed next to this thing. Um, with pods, you're effectively enforcing that by always deploying them together. But because it's a unit of deployment, I worry that you've lost that independent deployability. So I would almost, you know, I would think of my pod as my build artifact, and everything in it is part of that build artifact. Uh, pods themselves are also, <clears throat> they're not the mortal, they're the unit of scheduling. So these things will die and get spun up again. And Kubernetes will make sure the number of pods you want is what's running. So this is sort of useful. But you know, I, I, I always like thinking of the service. The logical concept of the service has primacy. That's what I want to think about. That's what I want to reason about. I want to deploy a service. I want to think of a service topology. Kubernetes has services, though, which is useful. So uh, this is a definition for a service in Kubernetes. It uses JSON. Uh, it does support YAML, but all their examples are in JSON because they don't like us. I think that's the reason given. Um, so anyway, this is a name. I've got a version for my service. Uh, and at the bottom, I can see some of that sort of standard port mapping stuff we saw in the Docker Compose example. So here's my topology, right? It's sort of emerging here. I can talk about how ports are in there. You can also talk about how things are related as well. The kind of where things start getting a little bit different, a bit of interesting, is that bit in the middle, that selector. And that selector stuff says, this service is made up of pods that match these criteria. And so you've sort of got this loose coupling thing going on, which 
kind of makes sense, I guess. It feels elegant, but elegance with adding complexity, and I'm not quite sure why. But nonetheless, I was thinking, OK, this is, this is not too bad. It's a mapping of metadata and a set of pods. This is effectively the topology. But the problem is you don't scale. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. So the way this works is on your node, you have your kubelet, which is a thing that the API server talks to. You have a thing running on that machine as well called the service proxy. And as you're deploying things, the service proxy is sniffing for pods that match its criteria and say, ah, oh, you're one of mine. Uh, I'm going to map your ports. And that's how it handles it. And it's a service proxy can also do also interesting things like effectively do load balancing for you as well. Where I start getting annoyed with these concepts and these abstractions is I logically think I have a service. I want to scale that service up. I want to see the health of that service. But you don't do any of that stuff with the service in Kubernetes. What you do is you go over here and do pods. You scale pods. You don't scale the service. Um, and it, that doesn't really sit well with me. And it, doesn't, it feels like an odd abstraction. It feels like an abstraction for a workflow I've never seen used outside of Google anyway. So Kubernetes. Simpler to set up than Mesos, I'd say just. You have a, a few fewer nodes. Um, it is a little bit higher level of abstraction. So it's a bit closer to a PaaS. This sort of service, this topology idea is more baked into the platform. With Docker Swarm, it's sort of an add-on tool. With Mesos, you're sort of doing that yourself in a way. Because this topology idea gives you that sort of high level of abstraction, uh, which some people like. Uh, I've spoken to people that work with Kubernetes and say, after about six months or a year, it really sticks. It's like, I don't really want to have to wait a year for that stuff. But anyway, uh, they're confusing. It is very new. right? There have been issues with it. There were issues sort of around Christmas time with getting it to scale beyond 100 nodes, for example, which is pretty small for these sorts of platforms, although that's probably plenty for most people. Um, there are lots of people who support this. CoreOS support this. Uh, Microsoft were really one of the first people to get out front and center with Kubernetes. They were running this out in the cloud. So you can get managed Kubernetes clusters running on all kinds of platforms, like you can, to be fair, with Mesos. Um, Redshift have uh, rebadged. They effectively, they've, they got rid of OpenShift v2 because it wasn't very good. Um, and their OpenShift v3 is basically Kubernetes with their stuff on it. Uh, so you're getting a lot of commercial companies now that are supporting this. This is very much also Google's play to ensure you've got cloud portability. So they want you to be using platforms like Kubernetes to have portability between Amazon and Azure and all those sorts of providers. So people normally do ask me, you know, what would I use if I had a choice between these three tools? Uh, well, firstly, and the key thing to understand is there's not just three of these things. There's like about 30. I used to work on ThoughtWorks putting together a thing called the Technology Radar. And every six months or so, we'd get together in a room and look at this stuff. And there'd be more and more platforms coming out that would sort of sit in this space at different levels of abstraction. It's a very confusing space. So I think if you're looking to pick your own platform, you probably shouldn't just have these three on your list. Maybe you need to have some more. But the way I think about it, and I hope I've shared some of my rationale about how I break these problems down, these are the tools I'd be, I, I sort of decided to look at for this talk, and are probably still the ones that be top of my list, although not Swarm. Too new, uh, too little known about it. I'm not feeling it right now. I'd bake these two off, probably. Uh, if I was more conservative, or if I had more mixed workloads, I'd be picking uh, Mesos over Kubernetes. Um, uh, Kubernetes is still a little bit painful on the operations side, I think, compared to Mesos. Um, but don't take my word for it. Your context is different. I would always advocate not listening to what people at conferences say and taking it word for word. If you're interested in this stuff, install a few of these things. Give them a go. Most of these tools you can just spin up on a hosted provider. You can go to Google and spin up Mesos clusters, for example, very easily. Just fire them up and have a go. And you can be up and running on, on, with Marathon in sort of less than half an hour. Um, so do bake these tools off. I'm hoping what I've shared with you is some guidelines that you can use to sort of have a look at that ecosystem and, and make rational judgments as these things change. We've talked about core principles. We've talked about the importance of independent deployability. This idea of having one artifact for all environments and that why the, why the Docker image, Docker container may well be that image artifact for us. We've talked about why we want the same deployment process everywhere. We talked about why Docker images as artifacts are a good idea and why they become so popular. People have fixated on, oh, look, I can run a one-line command that pulls down some arbitrary code from Docker Hubs and run it on my production infrastructure, as though that's the good thing about this stuff. And that's not. Uh, 
Again, friends don't let friends install images from the public Docker Hub. Um, we also talked about sort of from the criteria about how we select a platform. The thing I will say is this is a shifting sand. Uh, Fred talked earlier that we're still learning how to build microservice architectures well, even from the theoretical side or the modeling side or the API design side. And we're also doing that while sitting on top of technology that itself is still moving around. Things will go wrong. Technology you pick today, we'll dis you'll discover has major problems with it further on down the line. If you're going into this world, accept that you're going to have to get quite good at validating what's good for you, and sometimes saying, you know what, we're going to leave it six months. Um, on the other hand, you might decide to jump all in. Um, I have got time for some questions. There is a discount code for my book up there. If you, if you buy that from O'Reilly Direct, you get a discount code. I'm also do a podcast which you can get at samnewman.io forward slash podcast. So thank you.